please welcome Dr. Mike Dorkin. You must be fed up at the sight of me. I'm sorry. Um, so our, our next speaker uh, is a, uh, a great friend to all systems around the world. He's a professor of public health. Uh, he's the director of a fantastic uh, Institute of Clinical Effectiveness and Policy and Health Policy uh, in that wonderful city of Buenos Aires uh, in Argentina. And despite the fact that um, uh, he's in a, a system that is pretty impoverished, um, he's managed to translate his energy uh, and enthusiasm for improvement and for research uh, across the globe. Um, if you look at the number of papers he's written, uh, you're astounded at how he's created such collaborative efforts uh, from many workers um, in all the systems, the major uh, systems around the world. Um, he is also uh, uh, incredibly busy as the current president of the International Society for Quality in Healthcare, um, uh, and he's a driving force behind the WHO efforts uh, both to create the, the Patient Safety Action Plan, the Global Patient Safety Action Plan, but also uh, with our, some of us to, to help maintain and, and keep f the fires burning for the ministerial summits on patient safety, uh, which, uh, this, uh, which most recently was held in Santiago in Chile. And he was a determining factor in creating the environment so that so many ministers from across South America uh, came to that meeting. So it gives me huge pleasure to be able to introduce Professor Ezekiel Garcia Aloria. So thank you very much, Ezekiel. Thank you. Please welcome Dr. Ezekiel Garcia Aloria. Well, thanks, thanks, Mike, for the introduction and to, and to everyone to bear with me at the, at the last session. It's really a challenge to present today after so many good speakers. I will try to be brief and not to delay you. I'd like to congratulate the organizers for such a curated program. It's, been, it's my first session with you uh, those year, these years, and it's been great to, to see what happened today and what happened hopefully, hopefully tomorrow. Finally, I cannot see the audience very well, but I assume that there are not that many people for low-income countries among us today. And my case will be to, as Peter said already, to share with you the importance on trying to think on the other side of the wall. Because as uh, we may say, the, um, as we may think, sorry, most of the harm now occurs in less developed economies. So, just Mike introduced me. You know, I learned this from Don Berwick. This is my family, and this is why I'm doing this, just trying to give my children a safer world. Um, particularly, maybe us too, because as someone said before, we're all patients, or all we're going to be patients in the future, and systems usually do not deliver the right way. So this is the last picture when someone smiled in Argentina whenever we won the World Cup two years ago. So why am I here? As I said already, I'm just trying to make the case of patient safety in less resource settings, but also in high income countries because countries are always unequal and people are suffering in every developed countries and also in the world conflict that also Peter said before. So again, here we are talking about safety. And there's a lot of harm that is produced outside hospitals. So delayed diagnosis, mistreatment, over-treatments, are, those are forms of harm that patients suffer. They're less spectacular than deaths in a, in a surgery, in a, during a surgery, but clearly the burden of harm is quite huge around the world. So the problem is that I had the chance to participate in the Lancet Commission years ago where it was stated that 8.6 million people die from care, from, from sorry, from preventable conditions, and 60% of them died inside the system. So access is not a problem. And this commission only focused on developing countries, less resources economies. It was the first time in years that the community, scientific community did research consistently in less resource economies. That same year, for some random issue, uh, sorry, um, factor, 
three reports were published on less resource economies around the world. Another one published in the US, looking to the rest of the world, provided similar figures. 15% of deaths in less resource economies are related to harm, preventable harm. So the case is very important and very big. So our challenge is how to translate the findings from resource economies to less resource economies, as ever happens for all other issues around the world. But again, there's a lot of, we need to do a lot to improve this. So quickly, you know, the WHO provides this data that about uh, one patient, one in 10 patients uh, uh, are harmed by healthcare and three million deaths, as we Joe Kenny said at the beginning, are, are dying around the world. But in less resource economies, this is much bigger. And I don't want to read the slide. I just want to point you to the last two topics. One is that there is a less development about one point of the GDPs of each less resource economies is affected by this. So impoverishment, impoverishment is affecting our societies because of harm, preventable harm. And that's an economic consequence that I need to keep you in mind for a future slide. And also that patient engagement, we have been hearing from patient stories and trying to hear from patients and learn from them on how to improve healthcare can reduce harm in a burden of harm in 50%, which is a lot. And we're not using that resource, neither particularly probably in resource economies and clearly in less resource settings. So the reasons for this, of course, are mixed, but I'd like to mention two. A colleague from ISQA, Jeffrey Brownwave, produced a paper recently that produced this, that reported these three numbers, 60, 30, and 10. 60, 60 is the percentage of times that where we deliver qu good quality of care to people. And that could be debatable, but again, it's a low number. 30% is waste. It's the number of times that we provide people with care they don't need on the wrong way. And that's a critical point. I live in a country that spends about 10% of their GDP in healthcare, which is not bad, but we do it in a very wasteful way, wasteful way. So that's the critical point to share today. And I understand that for the US, it's also appropriate to say that unfortunately, the level of waste is too high. And then we have 10% as description of the level of harm that we're producing to people. So these three numbers may encompass the reasons for patient safety failures around the world. Another quick description is, this is a survey that WHO did last year among member sta states, describing the percentage of application of the Global Action Patient Safety Plan. And you may see that figures are not very high. So the reasons are ineffective care, waste, harm, and also still societies are not deploying the, the good care, sorry, the, the good um, interventions that you should be delivering for governments to reduce this burden around the world. Solutions. So I talk about the problem, just trying to give you again a perspective that harm is very common in resource economies, but also more importantly in less resource economies. We talk about the reasons, which is ineffective care, waste or harm. And about the solutions, I'd like to share briefly two comments from my setting. One is that years ago, I remember this Lancet Commission I mentioned, uh, the person that led that, Margaret Crook from the School of Public Health in Harvard, produced a new framework for quality. And again, try to think about the failures of quality as safety issues. Because again, safety started in hospitals by spectacular cases, unfortunate cases, where people die in, as someone said today, in the safe haven, the hospital. But whenever we're talking about quality of care, we should be considering what is a competent care and system. When a patient dies from a preventable cause, years after diagnosis, it seems that the, safety, the system could not take care of this person or if they have an event that could be preventable, a myocardial infarction, a stroke, those kind of things are affected lots of people around the world. And that's because 
our systems are not competent. And whenever we talk about how to fix patient safety, of course, we have to be mindful of microfixing, as Joe said this morning, of, or technology. But if systems do not provide competent care, we will not change what's happening around the world for decades. Then again, also positive user experience. If people feel discriminated, they don't have a voice, those kind of things also will affect the chances of being harmed by preventable causes. So this framework is changing how, how this landscape of quality of care. When, whenever you have foundations, structures that, provides, that suggest that safe care could be provided, the right hospitals, the right healthcare centers, the right technology, the right people providing care, also the process of care, competent care, competent systems, but finally the outcomes. And here, better health means safe care, of course. But also we need to have in mind that people need to trust systems because whenever we're not engaged, we're not activated, we receive poor care. We're in, so we're, we're in chance of receive poor care. And finally, the economic benefit. We need to work in safety first because people deserve that. We are all people that deserve safe care. But also we need to be mindful that the, the, the economic impact of safety around the world, it's very important. And for some reason we're ignoring it. It's a pity because the level of waste that we are generating, providing on safe care, it's huge. Some examples from our settings. Remember, as Mike said, I came from a country that is not doing very well. The region of Latin America could do better. I have our colleagues from Mexico here that the huge bunch from Mexico over there that they are in the North America, but also they suffer similar situations as we are down there in South America. But we try to provide some examples of implementation science because the problem is not to invent new solutions, mostly, is to implement what's been already known. And here I'm showing different examples from research papers, uh, research projects that we have been part of, where we're trying to improve care for patients, either through experiments or just translating the evidence into practice. And that's implementation science, and that's one of the solutions that we need to keep having in mind. Because again, most of the parental harm has solutions that are not being widely implemented. And that's unforgiven, unforgivable. Finally, story from Argentina, because why people, sorry, why some health systems are safer? Because people demand safety. And I live in a society that for the moment is not very inspired, not very, and I haven't understood yet the importance of patient safety. Because usually the people that die from preventable harm are the poorest, the eldest. It's one by one. It's like car accidents. It's very difficult to, it's not a Boeing that drops into the earth. So that happens also in my country. But recently, this is in Spanish just for pictures, the, there's a patient that died about, sorry, I don't exactly know, the, remember the date, but about five, seven years ago. And it seems that have, he died from a preventable cause. And his mother, try to change the system, trying to promote in law to punish doctors more for that, those type of cases. And we had the chance, the patient safety community back in the country talked to her and we helped her to develop a new proposal of a law that went through Congress and she's still in Congress. And that law is not punishing more, it's trying to learn from mistakes and trying to prevent mistakes to happen in the future. So that is halfway for Congress. It made its first step last year, and it will be on one of the few cases in the region when a patient, a family member, tried to change the health system from the outside, not being a healthcare provider, and promoting a change in the regulation that hopefully will make safety an issue for the system, if the providers will not be persecuted by mistakes, it will be helped to, pro to try to prevent them. We will hopefully report adverse events as a learning opportunity. And also a very interesting piece is that providers will be assessed as, as they age 
in their skills to provide care. So like as we are assessed to drive, uh, probably physicians, uh, particularly physicians, will be assessed to provide care. So those kind of things hopefully will be discussed by the upper chamber in future months, we'll see. My country passed one law in the full year already. So we are in a little bit of trouble. So it's a, we'll see if this will be the second in the year. But again, this is a very good example in just trying to change, because that's a picture in September. And that's a, 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 a billboard that the, her mother built in his, in his city where he lived. And hopefully that happens in the future. This is to ignite demand. And that's, that's something that we need in our region. Finally, I belong to ISQA, a, a society that has been very well represented among others by Peter Lackman in the past. And that society is trying also to network and to promote um, the, the uh, I would say, the, the partnership around the world in trying to promote safety. Since, like, um, like Don Berger said this morning, somehow safety needs to be revitalized around the world. And we are joining forces with WHO and others just trying to broker every member around the world from ISQA. Remember, ISQA is present in 70 countries. So we're trying to hopefully support the implementation of the Global Action Patient Safety Plan. And with that, trying to boost the presence of safety around the world. So my take for the way forward is that we need more measures in the developing world. Less resource economies do not have enough impact measurement on the case of safety. We need governance. We, we don't need more laws, but we need more effective implementation of accountability, another big issue in our region. Again, we need to learn from evidence and implement the evidence. So implementation of science is a critical point for, for us to hopefully translate evidence into practice. We need to ignite demand. People usually, citizens usually believe that Access to care solves problem. And someone said in, in one of the reports that I just showed that if we give access to more people around the world to healthcare, we will probably harm more people, which is a paradox. So again, it's, access is not enough. We need to ignite demand for, for, for users, for consumers, for patients to hopefully know more about their conditions, to know more about how to address health issues, and to con collaborate more with health providers to be, um, to be more healthier, to be healthier, sorry. So finally, persistence. You know, I've learned about the patient safety movement just recently, about three, four years ago, and it seems as if it's a, a refreshing attitude toward patient safety, and it and witnesses this today. And I have the sense that this is far from over, but we need to keep moving ahead. It's important that we keep pushing because it's the right way to go. And again, hopefully, um, we can finally turn the tide in terms of making people more proactive in thinking about healthcare and hopefully be uh, partners with providers in making safe care for all. So thanks again for the invitation. It's a pleasure to know more about what you're doing. Thanks for the ones remaining to the last session and see you tomorrow. Thank you.